Hey folks, welcome to day three of this week, Thursday of our live stream series. I'm so excited that you're here with me. We're going to be talking about how I screwed up a $200,000 sound system. Don't worry, it didn't burst into flames or anything. It just didn't sound too great. Uh, but we'll talk about some faulty knowledge I had, how I implemented it wrong in the array, and then what I know now, what I would do differently on the same gig. We're going to be waiting for just a little bit longer till 12.05 or about 5 Five minutes. I know it's not noon for most of you here on the stream, but thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, if you would let me know, where are you tuning in from? I know already in the chat, we've seen folks from France and the Philippines, and which is awesome. Uh, so let me know where you're tuning in from and what's your biggest mixing pet peeve? I'll go ahead and share mine. And that is uh, when kick and snare sound like they're in two different spaces. It's usually people are really afraid to send kick to a reverb because they feel like the low end would get too soupy or whatever. But I hate it when it's like kick real tight and then snare. So it's like kick, snare. And it just sounds really weird to me. But anyway, uh, so thanks for thanks for hanging out with me. I see uh, Boyd's joining us from Jamaica. You were with us yesterday. Thanks for coming back. Um, so yeah, let me know where you're tuning in from and what is your biggest mixing pet peeve. Again, there's a little bit of delay, so sorry for the awkwardness, but we'll get started here in just a few minutes. So I got Bob joining us from Dayton, Ohio. Derek is from Ireland. Uh, guitarists that sandbag you during sound check. That is a great one. You're right. They have their amp down at like a nice two and a half, and then they crank it up to 11 mid show, man. So Murray, thank you again for joining uh, here. I did get your email. I will respond. Um, I just been preparing this this uh, this morning. Faithful, I'm glad you like kick snare. Yeah, it just I just hate that discrepancy. What my drums sound like? They're all in the same room. So I send all my close mics. If so, if I got a four piece kick kick snare tom one tom two, those are all going at unity to the same verb. If I do anything weird with it, I can. But I want them to belong in the same space. So yeah, so what el what what else do you you folks have? What are you mixing pet peeves? So I'm gonna adjust this just a hair. There we go. So JD, please show how to read a phase line graph. So great. So um I think in my phase basics video I just released, I talk about that. Um I know that's that's looking a little different view of phase. That's honestly I, again not I'm going to pitch it in a minute, but that's in my course. I have a section just on that and how to read a phase graph. I do intend on releasing some of that on my YouTube channel in the future, but uh, my course is available at an intro price for just this week. So you can check that out at the, the link in this description. Uh, so yeah, but I, I we have Q&A at the end. And so if you hang around till the very end and folks are done asking questions, I'd be happy to open up a little bit of those slides and walk through some basics quickly. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on my 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 two hundred thousand dollars screw up, uh, and then we'll we'll hang out for Q and A. Uh, so Dustin says buried vocals are crazy loud symbols. Often those that usually comes together. <laughs> it's it's the the symbol. There's so much hash coming into the microphones that all you hear is the ride and not the vocal. So uh, mixes who adjust gain after sound check. Yep, kill the monitor mix. Yep, that's definitely a a pet peeve. So. Uh, and JD, so just make sure and remind me at the at the end about like, hey, cover some face stuff. And then so once once the dust settles from the other Q and A, I can step through some of that. I'll pop open some of the slides. Uh, Boyd asked me, do I do small gigs? Yes, I do small gigs. I'm doing like a, a acoustic show in Shreveport tomorrow. I'm gonna drive down there with some with the concert promoter. Uh, I actually probably do more small to medium sized gigs than big gigs. I've never done like a uh, I've done a 19,000 seat arena. I've done a 10,000 seat arena, but most of them are like under under a thousand, at least the local ones. And then I've done 10,000 seat amphitheater here locally. Anyway, so, but I do, if I'm mixing a gig, it's usually a, a higher profile corporate, like this just has to be done right. And it's being live streamed and going to a bunch of different places. So it's a lot of making laws and handhelds and and probably a band at the end, like sound really good for a stream for a small audience in the room, but it's, it's high profile. So don't screw this up. So, um, but it ebbs and flows depending on the season. Sometimes it's a lot of band gigs. Sometimes it's a lot of corporate it just depends. So Benoit people like me with the, uh, live who didn't start, but the chat was working. Refresh the video. 
Got it. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand you there. I'm probably just missing something, Benoit. I apologize. So, JD, uh, you're from the UK. Mixing-wise, people using no effects. Sounds too dry and nasty. Totally with you there. A dry sound is not good. Uh, but the worst one is cable management and bad coiling. Yes, oh my word. People not, you know, they're doing the cable wrapping around their arm like this. That's the worst. People need to over-under. All right. We are uh, just about at 12.05, so I'll look at our chat here. Then we will get started. Jerry says, Ironton, Ohio, pet peeve, not being able to hear the bass in the stream unless you're listening to computer system with subwoofers. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, folks, it's hard to mix bass right. If you're in the same room, you're feeling it in your chest from the subs, but you got headphones on, it's really, really hard to adjust. So that's, that is a challenge, especially from the same room. But yes, the bass is important and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, I promise it is because this is my, my bass guitar and it's a tiny little window there, but I am a bass player at heart. Okay, cool. Well, thank you folks so much for being here. Let's get started. So today's agenda is how I screwed up a $200,000 sound system. I didn't blow it up, it's not broken. I just deployed it really badly and it, the gig did not sound great, but I learned a lot. So we're gonna talk about my faulty assumptions from constant curvature arrays, uh, uh, how I transferred them to line arrays and what do I do differently now. We're going to do some live QA at the end. Uh, I'm going to pause periodically to see, make sure everyone's with me and you can ask questions about exactly what we're talking about. But with anything peripherally, we're going to, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about some phase stuff at the end um, for JD and uh, as well. So feel free to ask some questions. And then today will be recorded and posted on the channel, just so you know. And I see you, Benoit. Uh, I thank you for refreshing and getting on the feed. So, and yes, thank you, Heroic Angels. Uh, I do learn a lot from mistakes. So I've made a whole lot of them and happy to share those with you today. Here we go. But first, if you haven't heard, haven't been here this week or on my email list, I have released my first course, Making Sense of Sound. Show you a little preview right here. So this is the inside of it, the introduction, but basically what it's meant for is to give you a bulletproof foundation and how sound works. All the errors, including the one that I'm going to be talking about today, were all could have been avoided if I just had a better understanding of how uh, sound couples together, how fast does it move through space, how is how does phase work, how does amplitude work. And so by knowing the anatomy of sound itself, we can make much better decisions and then we can move into making better design and tuning decisions. So this is the course uh, it kind of breaks down sound this way, gets comfortable with decibels, velocity, amplitude, frequency, content, and wavelength phase atmospheric and acoustic conditions. And then it has three exercises uh, putting all these concepts together. So I, I think it'd be great for you. You can get that at the link below or produced by mkc.com slash making sense of sound. And you also, let's see here. If you get the advanced version, which you get this bonus course that has three sound system tuning walkthroughs. So it's me putting a GoPro on my head, walking through three different venues and tuning them and walking you through all of the decisions that I'm making in the field. So we have a single flown speaker. Um, so you'd be able to see EVs. me talking through my magnitude and phase traces, walking around here, trying to find a place where it shows the GoPro. Anyway, but yeah, so I'm in this church, a single flown speaker, and I'm trying to optimize it. And, and then I have two flow mains, four subs, and then five distributed mains and four subs. Anyway, so those are the bonuses, plus getting access to my private design file library. So you'll be able to see all the data from past projects I've uploaded there and be able to dissect it and learn from it. Anyway, so uh, the intro pricing ends tomorrow at 12 p.m., Central Standard Time. So that's 23 hours and 55 minutes from now it ends and it's going to go up after that. So if you're on the fence, uh, if you want a discount, get it before then. All right, that's the final last pitch for that. So let's jump into today's main content. Turn on my notes here. Put it over here. And let's go. All right, so here is the rig. And we've talked about this show uh, Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, and now Thursday. I know for uh, for Fateful You in the Philippines, it's already Friday, so you know, it's a little bit different. But uh, this rig, this is from the, the most recent time I did it. It's the, the University of Arkansas commencement ceremonies. And 
right here is the flown array in the house covering the bowl, everything up here. And I'm responsible for everything down here. I know some of you guys have, have already heard this on the stream, but just, just in case you haven't been here. So this array right here needs to cover that floor. These are the RCF HDL 6As, but the first two times I did this show, we had some Cara from L Acoustics, or Cara, however you say it, uh, 12 boxes per hang, and it was the majority stakeholder for taking care of this. So that's the gig, and we're gonna talk about how I royally screwed up the Cara array. But first, let's. how did I have these faulty assumptions about how I should have deployed the line array, all right? Before I was deploying line arrays regularly, uh, I was using constant curvature arrays a lot. So I was using things like the QSC KLA-12 or the JBL VRX 932 series. So to, if you're unfamiliar with it, this is two boxes of KLA. They're 18 degrees in the high frequencies and you could stack them together. You could also make another little friend down here and you can have up to, I think six in, six in the array, or I think five in the, in the KLA series but they are 90 degrees horizontally and then 18 degrees vertically. So by stacking two together, I'm able to make a 90 degree wide by 36 degree composite speaker. So I was like, oh cool, just stacking speakers together and I can get more coverage and just add more speakers if I need it. So that's how I understood constant curvature arrays. So what was my design philosophy with uh, constant curvature arrays? I wanted 4K even at all costs. It's at that time, I was also doing a lot of corporate gigs, so vocal intelligibility was paramount. Everyone needed to be be able to hear from the front row all the way to the back. It's the same at concerts, but you know when people I'm at running sound at a nonprofit banquet and someone's up there asking for you know hundred thousand dollars in donations, it better be heard. That's why they hired the production company to make sure every person there was heard. So that's what I was doing a lot of at that time. So here's the steps that I used in my brain for optimizing a constant cur curvature array. Here I am in VRX LAC or line array calculator. So this is for the JBL VRX. Uh, the only difference between it and a KLA 12 is it's only 15 degrees vertical and it's hundred degrees wide. So this assists you in figuring out what we need to do with our constant curvature array. Helps figure that out. So step one was to point the top box at the back row and the bottom box at the front row. So we can see here with these arrows, I had four in this array and this is pointed at the back row. This one's pointed at the front row. That makes sense, right? Just like point a speaker to make sure it gets all the way to the back and have some more until you needed to get down to the front. Pretty easy, right? And then I would look at the coverage at 4K because that's what the software it booted up with. If just a little check mark here at 4K and I could see that. So I would also go in and add these little probes. These are like little measurement microphones. And that's what you're seeing here down on the bottom right is the frequency response to that area. So I would add probes at each of the speaker locations where they're pointing, then also look at the coverage. So right here in the middle is this green blob of energy and I need to get it flattened out over the audience so it's even. So if it's up here in the air, that means that these people aren't getting that frequency, 4K, what I have selected, which is the green stuff down here. So I would say like, well, I have all my boxes at Unity, gain and Unity uh, on the high frequency shading. Not all boxes have this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time playing with that, but it does boot up with having a plus three on top and a minus three on bottom, and that's adjusting high frequencies per box to help even it out. But I thought when I plus, press the plus three button, um, I, uh, I, I hated the tonality of the box. It was always way too much top end. So I hated using it. So I would just keep everything at zero. So I didn't even use the functionality that would have helped me in this case. I just kept it at zero and I resorted to other means to flatten it out. So I would look at the 4k coverage and say, I need to fix this. How can I fix it? And so we need to measure the throw distance for each box. So I used a tool called pixel stick and I'll use it on the screen and measure the amount of pixels from here on the pink arrow from the top box to the back, the number of pixels for the green arrow, the blue arrow and the red arrow, it's throw distance. And then I would put it in a little calculator. So this is available in my audio mass survival spreadsheet or you can do the math yourself. So box A was throwing 910 pixels. And that serves as my zero dB reference point. And everything else is throwing less. So I think like, well, 
I can't turn these boxes up, at least not the JBL VRX. The top is zero. I can only attenuate. So if that one's throwing the farthest, I need to start to turn the other ones down because they're closer to people. So by calculating the offset of comparing this number to the top one and this number to the top one and this number to the top one, that told me the number of decibels I needed to decrease it to make them equal. And I also put in a range ratio. So you may say like, well, why do you have a calculator or spreadsheet that has you do it wrong? Well, this is useful for other things. We could talk th about that at the very end, but I was using this one, <laughs> or I guess I, I ended up using something very similar to this when I was calculating how to optimize constant curvature arrays. So then I went back in here and I plugged all those gain offsets right here. And then look, you see how bet much better the coverage is at 4K? That green blob that was right here only covering the first row evenly, like eh, not much here. It now is even all the way across. And I was like, pat on the back, Michael, and look right here. This clarity, or I thought in my mind from like 2K to 10K, look at those lines overlapping. That was like, oh yeah, look at my, my top end coverage. I really nailed it. Everything is even all across. If you can look at the rest of the figures of response, you can start to guess where we are going. So I thought, could I apply that same approach here when I got, you know, got this gig again, this was a, a while back, four or five years ago, something like that, where I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting some gigs. So like, this is some big boy line array stuff. Here we go. Uh, and it's like, okay, cool. Let me, let me apply that there. So I'll stop for questions about how that methodology uh, how I used it. Is that all kind of making sense of just measuring the distance of each box saying the top one's going the farthest, so we need to turn the other ones down to make it even across the audience. Is that is that making sense? Let me know. Pause for just a minute, take a drink. <clears throat> All right, folks. So let's move on. Uh, if I see some questions pop in, I'll be happy to answer those if something's not making sense. So we have, on this gig, I had 12 boxes per hang, so two big hangs of 12, and I had three boxes per amp channel. So I thought like, well, I can't gain shade every box and make it granular, so let me do uh, three boxes, or so three boxes, four zones, right? So, let me take my exact same design parameters that I had at that time was in, I'm actually here in map XT because sound vision doesn't do a good job, which is the sound vision is what you use to design L acoustics products. It's their uh, arrays, it's their software, but you can't do a side view and, and look at the frequency response like this. So I just rebuilt it with a similar array in map XT. So here was me saying, hey, let me point the top box at the array, at the back row. Let me point the bottom box and I just kind of played with the splay angles in the middle to get it to where it covered. I was like, okay, I'm pointing the, the line array exactly at where the people are, right? And again, if you're just joining, this is how not to do a line array. So, <laughs> so, and I wanted to inspect the 4K coverage and SPL. So this is looking at 4K. I look here at the very front row, it's this yellow color. Uh, if we, maybe it's a little bit closer to right, right at negative 18, but at the very back, it's down negative 30. So let's say uh, at best a 12 dB discrepancy front to back, which is unacceptable. So it's like, okay, I need to turn the bottom boxes down to account for this. So I measured the throw distance from each group of boxes. So there are four groups of three because that's how my amps were broken up. So I could just say, hey, the top three, next three, next three, next three, and turn them all down in succession. And then I would be able to get the desired result. So again, I plugged that in. I just measured in pixels on the screen. So it's zero at the top, minus 3.5, minus 7.8, and then minus 11.9. And then I went into the processor and here's the, the simulator or, or compass inside Map XT. And I put those game offsets and I, I, I zoned out those three boxes each. So that's what I was looking at. And then I said, man, look, look how much more even that looks <laughs> at 4K. And I look at 2K, I was like, oh, that's cool. And, and man, that was cool. And so I went and I did the gig and I did almost exactly this. And again, I was still just kind of new to line arrays and just wasn't, you know, really up to doing a good job. And here's the thing. I was like, okay, the high end feels even-ish, uh, but 
I had this tiny low mid issue. So let's uncover that. So here's the crux of, of what happened and how I screwed it up. Here, if I look at 200 hertz, see this giant hole? <laughs> That's called a, a lobe. <laughs> if you, and so, and then look behind the array. I got some nice rejection there, but let's see what happens. So here's 200 hertz and 250. Great. Now I have the same lobe and it's now moved up some. And now this one is creeping in. And then 400 hertz, now I have two lobes <laughs> of, of these people who are sitting there who are getting no 400 hertz. And then the same thing at 800. Now I have this one, this one, and this one. So that was my big problem, but at least my top end was kind of even, all right? Uh, so that was probably the biggest issue is that my low mids were all over the place, because, but I, I was able to only get it by gain shading which, which isn't the right approach. So we'll think, okay, what are, what are the big problems with that approach? So we had a, you decrease the headroom by gain shading uh, the, the total power in the boxes. So if I have the bottom boxes turned down by 12 dB, I've lost that headroom. I can't get it back because we think line array elements and boxes, and this is something that we covered yesterday, below especially below 1K, they're not this tightly focused little pizza slice anymore of energy. It's moving out more and more like a sphere as we go lower in energy. So we're, line arrays want this overlap in the low end to couple together and create a beam. And I'm ruining the shape of the beam by messing with the levels of adjacent boxes. And that's what gets us all this lobing. That's what's happening. Um, so it's not pretty. It doesn't sound great. We lose headroom. It creates those lobes. And then you, so you're sacrificing level variance in HF for vast tonal variance in the low end. So uh, I think I should have worded that backwards. I apologize. But yeah, so you're like, great. I got 4K right. Uh, but there's vast tonal variance in the low end. And it's not behaving like a line source anymore. Line arrays were not made to be used that way. So think like, what, well, what would I change now? What would I do differently besides gain shading each zone or each box? And so high frequency shading is a different deal. So first I would go back to this line array design principles. And this is one of the best infographics out there on the internet on that from Merlin Van Veen. But he assesses the range ratio needed. So we did you know, the very first step is measure the distance between the top box and the bottom box. So that's true. So in this design, it is five to one versus, uh, or, or it's basically, if it's throwing 100 feet to the back, it's only throwing 20, th 20 feet to the front. So that's 100 divided by 20, which is five. So that's a range ratio. Then Merlin has subdivided the array into an A, B, and C segment. And then he's able to use those to all couple together as they're composite speakers that are all moving together and then they are able to couple and then throw to the back it's not because there's a level difference every box is at unity in this array it is the tightness of the array because we have three boxes here in this a array at three degree uh, uh, one degree so it's only a one degree splay therefore there's lots of overlap and then they shoot farther i cover this more in depth yesterday on my live stream um, so make sure and check that out. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time of it here because we have a lot of repeat folks, but all that being said, we have line array elements that are really tightly splayed at the top so they can couple together and throw far. And then we gradually unfurl them throughout the bottom. Whereas his bottom element is two at a 15 degree splay. So that, that is a much bigger spread of the energy in the boxes. And a quick tip, if this is new to you, a great way to see if your line array is going to behave. I kind of recreated this on a different show. Uh, is you just look at the spacing of your the lines on your boxes. Actually, I'm going to start from this end. So here's this line to this line on this box. Sorry, I'll go down here to my audience height. And it's here. And if I move it here and along, I want to get as even as I can of spacing on these boxes. So I have a little bit of work to do here um, at this height, but this is what I, I tried Berlin Van Veen's approach here to the, by a book. Um, so all that being said, it's more so about using the mechanics of the array to get it right. So let's jump into that. So this show, back to the U of A commencement show, here's me building it the right way in MapXT. So I have 12 boxes of, this is Lena, 
and because it's similar to the RCF HDL 6A, so they actually ended up using on the show. So with that being said, I had, let's see, I had four boxes at one degree, four boxes at three degrees, two at five and two at 10. So that was my layout in of my zones. And this is the new design at 4K. So this is no gain shading, just using variable splay in each of my zones to get it right. So it's not perfect here. I do still have some DSP in the field that I could use some top end, but we can see at the very front, it's that greenish color at the very back, it's the cool blue. So there it's a less than a, or 60B spread front to back, which is what I shoot for. And then now, just to show you, there's no nasty lobes at 500 Hertz. <laughs> so here is that design at 500 Hertz and here's it at 125. And this is to show you, this is the entire array working together to make a beam and shape the low end, which is what it wants to do. And it can only do that if all elements in the line source are at equal level. And just to show you that the proof is in the pudding, here is the smart data from that show, uh, the mo my most recent time doing it. Again, I only have one single DSP drive line to the entire array with, with the HDL 6A rig. With the, with the Cara, I had four separate amp channels that I could process differently, but this is just one. So with just the array mechanics and EQ across the entire thing, uh, this, this is what I was able to get uh, at the front, middle, and rear. Um, and so I did, it was a little bit bright as you can see here in the front versus the back, but if I brought down the top end more and the whole thing, I lost it in the back. So that was the compromise I was willing to make. So if I had an output per box or even an output per, per two boxes, I would simply apply a high shelf on the top end to get the top end to be even. And then the array mechanics are gonna take, or are, are gonna take care of basically everything from like 1.5K down to 125 to make it all line up be even. And then everything below 125 is really subject to line length. The longer the line, the more you're gonna be able to steer it. Again, that's something I cover in yesterday's video. All right, here are some key takeaways and then I'll stop for questions about this uh, specific presentation and then we can open it up more broadly. So here are the key takeaways. All frequencies matter, not just 4K. <laughs> I know 4K is talked about a lot in even a Bob system design book, just as an example for coverage. So as a proxy for intelligibility and what your high frequencies are doing, 4K is right in the middle. And so uh, going up to 8K is a little bit too high, 2K is a little low, 4K is right there. So if you just wanna look at general coverage and intelligibility, 4K is awesome. But again, there are so many other frequencies we wanna be able to hear and getting it spectrally or tonally even throughout the entire audience is what we are after. Second, correct mechanics gets you 90% of the way there. So it was intuitive to think that I just point the top box at the back row, the bottom box at the bottom row, but that ignores the overlap between boxes that create the energy where I need it to go. So getting the design right from the get-go will get you 90% of the way there. Then you're just using gentle processing in the field, AKA probably a low, low shelf in the entire rig to shape the tonality, and then a high shelf per box to get the top end right. And number three, be always willing to admit that you're wrong and learn new ways of understanding things. This is a very humbling moment. I was like, oh yeah, I just flew this big rig and then realized I did it completely wrong. So, and had to go back to the drawing word. All right, so now time for q and A. I, um, yeah, would love to answer anything about this or any other questions you have. Again, thank you so much for being here with me. This has been fun to put together all, all three streams this week, you know, including the course. It's been, it's been great. So Laszlo asks, how does the LA Cara 2 sound compared to the RCF HDL 6A? Great, great question. So the differences between those boxes, the, the Cara 2 is a dual 10 woofer, and then the HDL 6A is a dual 6 inch woofer. So the size is different um, for sure. So the total SPL output is different. I think Cara has another 4 dB of max SPL compared to the HDL 6A. So I'd have to look at that. I would say from just a tonality standpoint, I would say the cars just sound a little bit, just sound a little bit bigger. Like they, they punch a little harder if they feel. 
uh, like the, the feel of them. And I would feel like the 10K and up range, like the, the really like airy, crispy stuff just sounds a little bit smoother and more pleasing. I'm honestly really impressed with the HDL 6As, especially for the price point. Having a line array box at that size for under two grand a pop, I think they're 16, 1700 a pop. Uh, they sound incredible, I think. And so in there, you know, the Cara 2 wants their amps in front of it. Uh, it's an passive box. So just there's a lot of workflow differences. The RCF is active, but tonality wise, um, if someone said I had to pick one and I had absolute, here, here's, here's an interesting conundrum. If someone said you could have an RCF HDL 6A rig and SPL wasn't a thing, I didn't have to ask a whole lot from it. The HDL 6A and then a processor output with every box or a car rig, but you only have like three or four boxes per amp channel, I might still go with the RCF just because I could absolutely control it when I want to do. Also, Cara being a bigger box, you're going to have a longer line with the same amount of boxes. So you're going to be able to steer low mids a little bit better. So anyway, um, so Boyd asked the program you use and what's the name of it? How can you get it? So the this one is map xt get it from myersound.com or just google Meyer Sound. and it's free you can run on windows or mac uh this one sorry ah there we go vrx lac it's windows only you can get it from jbl those are the two prediction um softwares we worked with today Ooh. uh jd asked were you mixing the show as well i was yep so I've, I've mixed this now seven or eight times, <laughs> I think, it's because it, commencements happen every year and they do every May and every December. So yes, I mixed it as well. Again, it wasn't a showstopper, the low mid stuff. It just was just weird and inconsistent. It was, everyone could hear because the top end clarity was there, but it just was enjoyable. Uh, what were the ramifications of the mistakes for the event sound overall? Great question, Bob. Yeah, I just felt like uh, so with the choir, I had a hard time with feedback with them. I had to be really aggressive because there was these certain just kind of fits and loaves and spurts just kind of going everywhere because all the different arrival times and different amplitude relationships between all the boxes. So it, uh, it made that tougher. And I just felt like as I walked the array, it just didn't feel even front to back. Again, the top end felt even, but I felt like there was it was just swimming around in the low mids and just felt unsettled. So I just wasn't happy with like the way the meat of a voice sounded or like the real heart of like the throat 500 hertz sounded. I just couldn't really trust what was going on in the audience. Uh, Heroic Angels asks, as a complete beginner, which course pack would you recommend more, your basic or advanced? If you're a complete beginner... I would probably, and, and like money's a thing, you know, it's 97 bucks and it's a, I think a fantastic place to start. If you want to go with advanced, just so you have those videos later and you're just getting them now at a deal, I am going to refilm them later and roll them up into a later course. So if you just want to see me actually tune three different rigs in the field, and that would be helpful to you. But the thing is, you're already going to have to know how, know the basics of how an audio analyzer works and what tuning is to really hang with the videos. That's why I made it advanced. But if you watch my other tutorials on open sound meter and how I set up my rig, it will get you probably halfway there. I do plan on publishing more videos of me actually tuning in the field uh, later on. I just wanted to build this fundamental stuff first. Boyd, how do you know when a room needs acoustic treatment? All of them need treatment all the time <laughs> is the answer to that. Uh, you can take an impulse response of the room. It's a measurement by playing a Dirac impulse into the room, and it'll tell you the decay time over frequency. And you can actually do a calculation of the room volume and then figure out the necessary decay time to make it sound great. And then if any given frequency range is above that or the ratio of a frequency range of you know the 125 hertz octave versus the 250 is out of whack, then you need to add treatment. But you need to add different types of treatment for different frequencies and placement and all that. So a uh, acoustics professional who's well worth their salt is Michael Fay. He also writes for Pro Sound Web. So if you want to know more, look for his articles on Pro Sound Web, and he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, but yeah, you need a lot. Is probably any room probably needs it. 
JD, so what issues mix-wise came from the bad displacement? Yeah, talked about a little bit. The I just really couldn't trust like the meat and heart of the voice on the podium microphone. I it, like it felt okay at front of house, but as I kind of walked the room and tested it, it just sounded different in every seat, which is not what we want. People are hiring us as systems engineers to make it consistent in every seat, and I couldn't deliver that. I, and so I just found myself just kind of chasing my tail a little bit. I had feedback issues with the choir, or it just took me a long time to wrangle it. That that wasn't fun. Um, were the two two big things. So again, it, it wasn't a showstopper, and someone like the untrained ear probably thought it sounded f- just fine. Uh, again, it's an arena, so it's just big and echoey anyway. But uh, to my standards, it just wasn't as clear and full and intelligible as I wanted it to be. So Derek asked for a small club band gig. What DBSPO would you be aiming for in the front row? Uh, I would say not more than 100 DBA, maybe 101. Yeah, I think in the middle of the audience at front of house, 97, like for like a good full chorus feels nice and full for like, yeah, this is a big rock show. And then, so if I want no more than plus or minus 3 dB front to back, so 97 plus three to the front is 100 and then to the back would be 94. So I, I feel like that probably be a good good way but again make sure you have an accurate spl meter and you're logging it right you're using a weighting um not c so to get accurate numbers so cng and a bunch of letters ask on per box processing i'm sure you're aware the hgl 26 30 and 50 have built-in processing via rdnet absolutely would this be more practical compared to the l acoustics system okay so on the L Acoustics rig, it's just a, it's just a difference in de- design and deployment philosophy. RCF has decided that their flagship systems are going to be active, and then they're going to throw computers in them that have processing. So there's no amps on the ground. They just have a power rig that sends it up. It's of a big rig. So they say, hey, we're going to make it a little bit heavier in the air because it has power amps. We're going to give you ultimate granularity because, like you said, processing per box is really powerful if you want to be able to do that. Cara, if you have enough amps, I could do an out amp output per, per channel, if per box. I would just need 12 amp channels per hang, which is a lot of amps. <laughs> so I could do that. Uh, but some manufacturers tout like, oh, wow, you can put six of our line arrays in one amp channel. Well, that's fine um, if you don't want any granular control in high frequency shading, but I like having that. So the next time I'm going to be doing this show, hopefully in December, I'm not going to be mixing it. I'm just going to be system teching it. And the production company that I'm going to be working with, I think is going to have an AHM 64 from Allen and Heath from that point. So I'm going to have a lot more outputs to play with than just my six matrix outputs. Because I think it was, uh, I have a video on my channels, like how I tuned in an arena uh, with just an M32 and six matrix outputs. That's this show. And I show you how I set up my M32. And I also stepped through it more slowly with the first live stream I, I did this month, uh, did this week of how I set up my console for system processing. So if you have limited outputs, I show you how to do it. But yes, having more control is always good. Again, I'm rarely, if ever, gain shading the whole box. I'm just basically touching 1K and up per box because that's where I have isolation, usually 1.5K and up. So that's a good rule of thumb. If I need to adjust the tonality of the rig and it's something below 1K, I have to do it across the entire hang. If I'm doing it per box, it's 1K and up. So uh, for live shows, do you recommend A or C waiting for your sound meter? I recommend both. In Smart uh, V9, you can log all of the things all at the same time. And so A waiting is a, if someone asks you like, well, how loud, how loud was the show? They're probably asking A because that more closely corresponds with human hearing, but C waiting, um, court, it lets you hear like you know, basically 20 to 20, but live shows have a severe low frequency up tilt and really skew the total SPL number. But you can also look at a metric called C minus A. So if the A weighted at front of house is 97, but the C weighting is 120, that means we have uh, a 23 uh, C minus A weighting, which means we might have a lot of low frequency exposure, which is a whole lot. So all that being said, I use A weighting. And if anyone is going to ask uh, for like, is this dangerous? Or there's like a standard at a festival, like a speed limit, like you can't mix above 95, they're talking about A weighting. Uh, Michael Lawrence has a ton of really great articles on that on Pro Sound Web and his blog, just Google that. Also, uh, uh, 
Sorry, it's on my bedside table, but his book is out now too. So make sure and grab that. So he's a phenomenal systems engineer. I talked to him this morning on the phone about some stuff, but definitely check it out. All right, uh, Rakesh Patel, what's your thought on Fulcrum Acoustics FL283, uh, especially their cardio technology? I've never used it, but I've heard wonderful things about it. So I wish I could weigh in here, but I know they're brilliant. I know their TQ processing is really cool. Uh, and I've actually am trying to quote an L- a, a, a Fulcrum Acoustic rig for an upcoming church install, but they're point source speakers. So uh, I, I wish I could use it. It would be a lot of fun. I just haven't used it. But as far as passive cardioid, that's really cool because it saves on processing and you're able to have a single sub with one output and not have to do like double up subs to get a cardioid configuration. All the cardioid configurations I teach on my channel you require multiple elements to pull it off. So having passive cardioid just in one element itself is, is really cool. Uh, Rick had, oh, Rick, I can't wait. Do you believe that learning by osmosis is a thing and how much would you charge for that type of training? I love Rick. Rick is here with me locally. He's a wonderful uh, freelancer and also a jokester. So thanks for being here, Rick. Uh, Dustin Beatty, during the show, did you correct on per channel EQ? Did you do some overall correction on the console? If it was corrected on channel EQ, did you go up into the ball and listen to it? So yeah, great question. So correction, meaning like I, I, I'd ask more specifically where correction. So if I heard something wrong, I was here's what I did do to mitigate stuff during that show. I get that show. I was chasing my tail. I wouldn't like try, try and trust anything I did, but here's what I do now later on. Now knowing a little bit more of what I'm doing is if I hear an issue, I see if it is localized to the floor where my PA is. In addition to those two hangs of 12, I got six front fill speakers and then four subs on the ground. Um, so it's something I would listen and I would go up to the bowl and I level match the bowl to the floor with the microphone at the middle of the floor and then the middle of the bowl. So I was able to trust that and I tuned them. Again, I only had one matrix output to feed the whole bowl. So I just EQ'd that matrix output to get that system on that array to to cooperate and be at the same target curve. So I could pretty much trust it was going to feel differently. What's way different from being on the floor than the bowl is the signal or the... uh, direct to reverberant ratio. It's a lot longer throw from that EAW hang all the way to a bowl seat versus my floor. So it's less coherent. So I, I actually probably ended up mixing the bowl and I brightened it up a little bit later to get more high frequency there, even though that was different than the way the floor sounded because we needed more intelligibility top because it was such, I mean, more than double the throw to the average seat on the floor. Um, I hope that answers your question, but yeah, I, if I heard a specific problem in just the podium microphone, I went to the podium microphone, but if the choir sounded weird, I'd go there. Um, and then I had like a five piece rock band as like an intro walk-in thing and then video rolls, whatever. So Derek Sheedy, how'd you get into being a sound human? Uh, I started playing bass. Well, I actually started playing violin that I played bassoon through middle school then all my friends started playing guitar and so did my dad. I wanted to be in a rock band. So I started playing guitar, but I was the worst one. And I read bass clef. So I switched to bass guitar, studied that. Uh, in high school, I got an audio interface, a Apogee Duet, the original Firewire 400 one, which was a lot of fun. I started recording some projects, got into that, went to music school, um, studied string bass there. Still was much more on the live side of stuff, but actually I met the guy who hired me for that show at University of Arkansas, the commencement ceremonies, owns and runs a VOD3 event production here in town. So I was his first hire out of college uh, now 10 years ago, and that's where I learned live sound was was under him. Studio was fun, but I just wanted to learn something different. And that's been my career. I dove really deep into bass. Let me try something else. Let me get into recording, dive out. Let me get into live, and that's where I, I am now. Uh, it's been a blast. So, so for a love of music, into recording, transferring those recording skills into live. Uh, but it's not probably about five years ago until I really got into system design specifically. I was a good live mixer. I could throw some speakers up. I'm a personable A2, but it was me just really taking the time to dive into Bob's book and trying things in the field to really learn this craft specifically, and I've fallen in love with it. So that's the quick story. Optimus Braun, greetings from Germany. Um, Danke. So you, I'm sorry. That's probably really insulting. I apologize. You really do a great job with the channel. Lots of info. Well presented. You are a pro. Well, thank you so much. JD, what's a good software to measure SPL and all that live sound stuff? Uh, get smart. 
if you if you can afford it, I know it's pretty pending. They now have subscription pricing, uh, but their SPL one isn't included in the base package. So uh, Open Sound Meter just released an SPL feature. I haven't tried it yet, but I've talked with some other folks who have found it a little bit buggy and inaccurate. So if you want a true SPL measurement, you can try the Room EQ Wizard route, uh, but you do need an SPL calibrator. It's a little tube you put on your microphone and play a test tone through it and calibrate your mic preamp. So I think Room EQ Wizard can do it if you just need SPL. Um, but if you really just want to go all the way and have all the tools, I would just get smart now at version 9. I think they still have the intro pricing on that too. Uh, Boy, Dennis, can you make a good rig with all the boxes or different brands or they all must be the same? They don't all have to be the same. If they're going to be coupled and close to each other, like in a line array, you, you don't want to mix, mass, mix and match line array segments. But on this show, I had... Uh, RCF mains, I had QSC front fills and subs. So I was able to match those, it was just fine. The biggest discrepancy was in the RCF front fills and the mains because the phase response is much different and the tonality is different. So I can't do anything about the phase response because uh, I didn't want to throw a bunch of all-pass filters on the RCF and I didn't have that processing anyway. But you can definitely match mains and subs from different um, different manufacturers. You just have to do your homework, take a measurement with them side by side, figure out what filters are going to work and then make it work in the field. So Fateful asks, being a bass player yourself, can you say it is advantage for a sound guy to be musically inclined? Absolutely. I would say I just spend 90% of my engineering brain setting up my musical self to succeed when I'm mixing. <laughs> so I'm able then to, it also helps with just building relationships with the band. So if I'm in there and uh, I apologize, I'm not talking full screen. If I put the camera full screen, my um, OBS starts to hate me. So I'm, I'm just going to stay really small in the corner. Um, anyway, yeah, so I can talk with the band. I can start building relationships with them early. So when I have to go to the drummer midway through and say like, hey, your cymbals are killing me, it's not the first time I've talked to them. And I'm not saying it that way. I'm like, hey, those are some uh, minor cymbals or Istanbul's. I think those are really cool. You're, you're playing great, but uh, I'm having a hard time getting the vocals above the cymbals. Can you trim it back another 20% for me? That'd be awesome. So it really helps in relating with bands, listening better, and just how I end up mixing. So it's really helpful. And being a bass player, you're listening from the bottom. You're building on the foundation. So I think that's advantage as well. I found a lot of sound humans are bass players, which is fun. Uh Boy, do you make EQ videos and other lessons? I have my nine EQ pivot points video. So check that out. And it's a PDF in my audio toolkit. I do plan on making that to a full course in the future on EQ. Uh, I would check out the Audio University YouTube channel and he has some great videos in EQ. And there's also a sound like an ear training company and I forget what they are, uh, but has some stuff on EQ and you can get a free trial of that. Dustin, uh, awesome. Makes sense. I just didn't know that changes messed up the bull feed a lot. Got it. No. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's kind of, you have to run sound or at least system engineer, uh, like a democracy. You have to be like, what changes can I make that affect the, uh, the most amount of people, the least bit. So anyway, it's a good question. Uh, Hey, Michael Lawrence is in here. Precision audio services, early adopter pricing on smart until December 31st. Fantastic. So yeah. So if you're thinking about getting it and pull the trigger, definitely go for it. Uh, version nine has been awesome. Um, I've had V8 for, for, for a while. Uh, again, they make an incredible product. Um, and I use it all the time. So it's, it's killer. And these have been some great questions. Um, anything else? Uh, we want to cover and I'll give a few minutes here. Then if not, I'm going to do a little bit of a, uh, phase preview for, uh, let's see at the very beginning. Let's see. I think it was JD who asked. Yep. 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 So we'll do a, a phase graph, a speed run, if you will. And again, that's covered in depth in my course. I plan on uh, posting more on that on the YouTube channel anyway, but it's really concise there. So any, any last thoughts before we jump into a phase speed run? Yes, phase traces are confusing. They, they really wig me out for the longest time. Okay, let's see. Get out of that. Here we go. All right, 
Derek says, uh, thank you, Bob, for the kind words. Thank you. Hi. Uh, here we go. Drum cage. Drum cage is to make drums quieter in the audience so you have more control in the house. <laughs> that, that's the way to use it. Uh, great. So here we go. Let me answer this one question from Fateville. Given if, uh, Fateful 01, and then I'll jump into the face stuff. Given if you have the DSP available during a gig, what DSP would that be? Right now, I'm looking at, at the AHM 32, the AHM 64. It's it, from Alan and Heath. It's just a huge amount of uh, bang for the buck as far as outputs and zone. You have zone to zone processing, which is really cool. Uh, Michael Lawrence actually owns one and used one for a while until he got his galaxies, which are amazing. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Again, for the HM32, it's under two grand. 12 analog ins, 12 analog outs, analog outs. You can throw a Dante card in there. It's a really cool processor. Uh, yes, a drum cage, it is necessary. Oh, and Michael still uses the HM regularly. And you've expected for a few installs. Yes, that my first time getting a hands on one was for an install I did at a church in Little Rock. Um, and I covered that install. Um, the first I, I get my live streams this week mixed up one of the two live streams earlier. Uh, Dave asked, How did you learn to use Ease Focus? There aren't many. There aren't many tutorials on YouTube. There are not, and that's why I made one. <laughs> I, I went line by line through the manual um, and just really just tried to figure out what was happening. And so I just sloughed my way through making a few designs. I had a really good foundation in Map XT. I tried to figure out what can I do in Map XT that I can't do in Ease and try and go do it. So that's a really great, great way to learn in general is give yourself adjacent scaffolding to kind of like Mario jump off of or double jump or whatever. Um, so like, okay, I know I can do this. Can I go and find it? Um, and so it's a lot of trial and error. But uh, so I think hopefully my tutorial out there is helpful <laughs> to people because I hit a lot of speed bumps along the way. I didn't even know about the advanced version or extended version of Ease uh, like less than a year ago. <laughs> so I was missing a lot of, of features there. So anyway, that's how I learned it. Just kind of diving in. Okay. Let me, let's, uh, sorry. It's like forcing me to present right now. I don't want to go to that slide. Ah. Let me try it this way. So here's all the slides for the course. Uh, the processor model will is the AHM-64 from Allen and Heath. They also have smaller versions of 32 and a 16. So I think it's a killer value and I'll probably investing one in this year. Okay, so on my YouTube channel already, I have a video that basically covers, it talks about phase basics, spacing your subs and something else, whatever. So this has these slides here and actually starts with a quote from Michael Lawrence. Phase describes where a certain frequency is in its cycle in degrees. So that is a, just a really succinct way uh, of saying that. Phase works like a clock. You can watch a race and I'll walk through this stuff right here uh, and then I stop. So this is where I'm going to pick up. So you lucky folks attending here live get to see the rest of specifically how to read a phase graph. Here we go. Slideshow mode. Phase graph basics. Here we go. So here we are at open sound meter, uh, just to have a little bit different flavor and look from smart. This uh, is a phase trace of an RCF TTL 4A. So this was taken by somebody else. And this is what we got. So we can see here, this is our zero degree line in the middle. And on the bottom, our X axis is frequency. So just like an EQ, an RTA or whatever, that's here on the bottom. And then on the top is degrees. So we start at zero and go positive 180 or negative 180. So we can see here right at, looks like, uh, what about 400 Hertz is at zero degrees. And then it moves up and down from there. So what in the world does that mean? So it requires a reference signal to be time zero. So again, measuring phase requires a two channel measurement, a transfer function. So putting out an RT, like a single RTA mic, we need it to compare it to something. So that's why if you're running smart or open sound meter, you always have a reference of the pink noise that you're shooting, shooting out or whatever test signal. It's comparing it to that. So we always have to compare it. So on this RCF, 
it said, hey, right here in the mid range, everything is on time. So if you see a flat phase slope, if you will, that is on time. If it is downward, it is behind. And if it's upward, it is ahead or leading. And so you think, well, how can something be ahead or how can an input be ahead of the output or output be ahead of the input? Well, it's because we can play with the alignment or the synchronization of the reference to what you're measuring. So if you just use like the auto locator on, on, on smart and it latches on, it's gonna look for high frequencies, find an impulse, like use the IR to find a spike that can line up usually in the top end. So you're usually gonna find the top end flat on a speaker and it's gonna trail down and be late down below that. So this, I just manipulated it a little bit to show you a downward slope is lagging, flat is on time, and upward slope is leading. So this is a VRX 932LAP. So this is a speaker we are talking about earlier. We can see here, it starts flat here in the upper range, and then it goes, it lags, it lags. And so what we see here is my red arrow and this blue one, a wraparound. So it's going around the phase wheel. Again, if this is a little bit confusing, go watch my other video, Phase Basics, on the channel that talks about phase, how it works like a clock and it's cyc cyclical. So you start at zero, it goes to negative 180 and then all the way back around. It's 360 degrees, but this graph just shows us zero in the middle. And then we have positive 180 and negative 180, which adds up to 360. So that's called a wraparound when we start to go. So we could theoretically slice this off, slice this off and slice this off and then kind of break them apart and stack them up and it'll be one continuous line up and that's called unwrapped phase, but it's much easier to read in a concise uh, place here in wrapped phase and it's also better data for us for nerdy reasons I will not go in, go into. So when we see something moving away from flat, that's called phase shift. So it's, it's shifting up, uh, the, the, the timing is getting delayed. So we can see here, everything right here is basically on time, then everything else is shifting late. That is what this phase graph is telling us. So it's flat on time at 8K, and it's negative 45 degrees from zero. Uh, the goal isn't get to get everything to zero, it's just telling you the relationship of that. So it lags as we go lower in frequency, that is a downward slope. So I guess from left to right, that's downward. I know we're kind of moving up. Um, but then it wraps around again at 1.8K, eight, 1 it keeps lagging, and now we wrap around again at 68 hertz. Okay, so those are our points. And then it stops here at 40 hertz. That's where the speaker bottoms out and we have no more data. So how much phase shift occurred in degrees from 8K down to 40 hertz? We can measure that. We started and ended at negative 45 degrees. So we see here on the left-hand side, I got that circled, but we went around the full circle twice. So we are two complete cycles, or I guess, uh, I guess trips around the phase wheel basically uh, from these two frequencies. So we are zero degrees here at negative 45, go around, then we move at 360, we go around again, and now 720 at 45. So uh, we can kind of say like, this is noon, now we went all the way around, now it's one o'clock, all the way around, now it's two o'clock. But it's still reading, you know, the, the 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 minute hand is still now resting at 12 at the start of the hour, but our our, two, our short hand is now at two o'clock, is basically what's happening. So now we are 720 degrees different from 8K all the way down to 40 hertz. So we basically, with this speaker, we have a roll step of the high frequencies arrive first, and we can see it kind of rolling through in the low frequencies late. Again, this is very normal with loudspeakers. Uh, because of filtering. Uh, filtering and just the acoustic behavior of the speaker and again, more nerdy stuff, but this is normal to see in a speaker unless they're using something like an FIR filter to adjust magnitude and phase independently to get the phase trace to be flat. So when some speaker is touting their ability to use like in RCF, they call it fur phase or FIR phase, um, they are doing that to get their the HDL6A we were talking about to get it flat, basically all the way down to about 150 hertz, and then it starts being delayed. Lazo asks if I connect my loop signal into the USB card, not through my console, it can it can be a problem. It's not a problem. You just have to know that your your route your delay times are going to be uh, not as 
like the, the relative delay times before between microphones are all going to be the same, but the absolute propagation time of the whole system is not going to be trustworthy. So it's because if you have a loop back, it's following the exact same path as the measurement signal because it has to go out your uh, D to A and back in your A to D. But if it's not doing that, you're not accounting that latency in your measurement. Again, you can use the delay locator to sync it up and you're fine, but it's just that's just not going to be accounted for in your measurement. So, so when we're asking about phase delay, assuming it's from high frequencies on time or low frequencies lag, we're asking how much later does the toe touch the ground versus the heel? So you can calculate phase delay in its time translated version of like, okay, 40 Hertz actually came, you know, 4.3 milliseconds late or whatever. So yeah, how much later in time is 40 Hertz compared to a K that's beyond the scope of today, but being able to look at the graph, we can see at least in degrees measure how many degrees late it is. So that's for another course. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of the speed run on the phase graph. Uh, Again, I, I plan on doing a more comprehensive version, like level two of this course, and that would probably be wrapped up in looking at uh, an analyzer like Smart and the workflow and how to read that data more in depth overall when you're tuning. But that's a phase graph. I would just say flat is on time, downward slope is lagging, upward slope is leading, and then use your delay locator to absolutely latch onto where it needs to and play with it. One feature in Open Sound Meter that Smart does not have is the ability to uh, play with the virtual delay so you can like mess around with the with the phase a little bit which i think is pretty cool uh, that's basically what what i use it for these days if i need to look at something different but anyway that's a look at the phase graph so jd was that helpful to you quick speed run of that um later on i talk about you know two looking at two different face traces and how they align. I give the example of a, a main sub alignment because that's just an easy way to look at two face traces overlapping. Anyway, so that is that is the, uh, the, the speed run there. <laughs> awesome, I'll pause for just a little bit longer for any last questions. I appreciate every one of you being here, especially uh, those of you, you hung out for all three. I appreciate your time. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, yeah, so let me know any last questions or just uh, sign off and say, see you, Michael. Go, go get a coffee or something. That's what I'm going to go do. Woo. Uh, I will I will say, just as a gentle reminder, tomorrow is the last day to get intro pricing. So before noon, Central Standard Time, so 23 hours from now, uh, it, the price goes up. Dustin asked, do you use Ease, uh, uh, ease, ease 3 or Ease 4 or mainly Focus. I don't have Ease 4. I guess that's the super expensive version that has acoustic <laughs> calculations in it too, but I just use Ease Focus 3. Um, maybe I should invest in the other one day, but Ease Focus 3 does what uh, I need to do. I've thought about diving more into acoustics to starting to do some consultation and prediction there. But again, there's there's folks who've been doing it a lot longer than me and know a lot more. And I've, I feel like I, I might just stay in my, my lane here. Um... Heroic Angel, still trying to understand everything, but I appreciate your hard work. Uh, Boyd, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the lesson. Appreciate you hanging out here. Derek Sheedy, thanks for the streams and also all the other videos. Makes everything a lot easier to understand. You're, you're very welcome. Glad I could help out there. Again, I just hope to serve as a gateway to you know have stuff on YouTube that's really substantive, but also point you to other people uh, out there doing really good work, like, like Michael Lawrence, like uh, Merlin Van Veen, like you know, all the authors on pro sound web, um, because they have taken the time to write articles that are for that audience and for this field. I know a lot of people, when they want to find out something, they just type in YouTube and you find me, but, uh, I just want, there's more of us than just me and YouTube doing this. So, so please check out, uh, pro sound web, check out Bob's book, check out Michael's book. Um, it's all just a wealth of stuff. And I'm just hoping to kind of condense it and sift it through what I know and how I experience the world and put that out here for you. Thank you so much. Um, Dave, thank you for the videos. Uh, I, I do. And so, oh yeah. So let me know. I asked this last time, uh, I've toyed the idea of doing like a, a once a month live stream, maybe like a Q and a Friday where I can teach like a short session and open it up. Uh, if that sounds like fun, let me know if you would like that. Cause I've had a lot of fun going live. I can't do it three times a week. <laughs> so do something like that. Um, so JD, kind of, I think you need a version of that. But for, okay. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll I can uh, I think I go through it a little bit slower in the course. So I know that again, that was a bit of a speed run. Uh, I know uh, even Michael Lawrence has on his Precision Audio Services YouTube channel a reading the phase graph demo. So he probably explains it better than I do. Um, so, so Laszlo, L acoustic sound signature sound is really that good for all type of music. I mean, L acoustic stuff when deployed right, I think can sound really good. There's all there's just some marketing claims and workflow things that they make that kind of irk me a little bit. Um, and they're a little bit more close fisted with how all their stuff works. And so if you could get past that, you can still get good results out of the system. But L acoustics rigs when deployed, right. And if I have all the control I need to over the system, I can get really good results out of, um, so would love that. That'd be great. I'm assuming you talk about the live stream. Yes. So, uh, that'd be a great idea. You're in. Oh, I would like that. Great. Okay. So it sounds like y'all are all in. I'll see you all there. It'll be a party. Um, and yeah, I'll keep them 12 p.m. Central for now. Um, I didn't really know about frequency so much and the calculations, but I hope to continue listening to you and I'll learn. Great. Yeah, just keep keep engaging in here. Uh, again, there are other educators out there who are more doing like boots on the ground mixing and console stuff and all like that. So check them for the foreseeable future. I'm going to be focusing in here on sound system design until no one shows up to my live streams and I'll try something else. But um, awesome. Well, I appreciate all of you guys' this time. Um, so much for being here and investing in, uh, your own craft. Um, it's been great. I really enjoy putting this stuff, all this stuff together. I, I enjoy, I learn better cause I'm having to like really think through stuff and know where my holes are at. So I think the best way for you to be able to do that, um, is do that, put this stuff to work in the field and, and, and see if it works for you. Um, not everything I say isn't gospel, but I hope it is helpful to you. Uh, Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And then weekend, I've got a fun gig in Streetport and mixing for Penny and Sparrow, a fun little American acoustic duo that has amazing voices. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, I will leave one more minute for questions just in case there's whatever. And then I will sign off. As I'm staring through this eight second delay, awkwardly waiting for anyone to say anything. <clears throat> Newscasters got it tough. This is hard. Just going, going live, live, live. Whatever. Uh, faithful, you're very welcome. Thanks for staying up till 2 a.m. in the Philippines. Faithful. That's a shout out there. That's, that's dedication. Uh, all right, cool. No questions. Sounds wonderful. Thank you all so much. Again, have a great weekend and I will catch y'all later. Oh, sneak peek. I got some fun videos with Michael Lawrence coming your way about a tour and like big rig stuff. It's going to be really cool. Uh, great. All right. Cool. All right. See y'all.